Um, for the next hour, we'll have uh, a panel discussion uh, of some of the issues around the report. Um, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Victor Fung, who will moderate this, uh, this panel. Uh, Victor, as I'm sure you all know, is chairman of the Fung Group in Hong Kong and uh, has been very involved with this process. In fact, was the co-chairman of, uh, of the executive committee that produced the report. Uh, so I will, with no further ado, turn it over to Victor and let him run the show. Thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, first of all, I'd like to also extend my very warm welcome to all of you. It's also great to be back in Washington. It's, uh, I have to echo C.H. Tung's words. You know, I, I think uh, your, your, your adrenaline's flowing when you're in Washington. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm very happy to be able to uh, moderate this particular panel. I think you've heard from our speakers. The U.S.-China relations, in my mind, without a doubt, is the most important bilateral relationship in the world. Not only because of the size of the economies and the fact that they are major participants in different aspects of the global economy, but I think also because in today's world, I think we need some leadership in the global economy to really, in my mind, think about reestablishing the efficacy of the multilateral systems and I really look to the two nations to take the leadership role working together on that basis. We'll come to that as we go uh, through, through our panel. I, I'm very happy today to be able to, to have a very distinguished panel uh, with us. Uh, I will introduce them in a moment. But before we start, I just want to emphasize one thing, which really is a follow-on to what Larry uh, and, and, and Mike have said about the, um, uh, the report. I, I view the U.S.-China relations not only as the most important bilateral relationship in the world, uh, but also very often we tend to think of it as a zero-sum game, a win-lose situation. I think that's, that really would be very tragic if it became a zero-sum game. To be sure, there are differences on both sides. But I think there is also a huge white space in the middle for the two sides to cooperate in their own national interest. So we're really looking at, um, and, and in, the, in, the, in the technology and the, and the, and the words of uh, 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 Professor Mike Spence, this is a very complex, multi-phase, uh, uh, non-zero-sum game. Okay, and we really need to exploit the non-zero-sum nature of this, the cooperative nature of this. So one of the things we're really focusing on in the report is over the next 10 years, as, 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 as the, the, this relationship evolves, how do we come up with different ways in which we can actually think about win-win cooperation, win-win aspects that would actually build trust for us to deal with some of the more uh, problematic issues that will obviously surface. And I, I think that, that, that idea of how we actually work that white space, I think is going to be absolutely crucial. In, in my mind, I, I think uh, this, this bilateral relationship um, is also anchored in the economic relationship. If we look back over the last 30 years, it, that is what started this relationship. This is what this relationship has been built on. But to be sure, today we must go beyond the economics. But we cannot forget about the economics. It's still the bedrock on which we're building. So the fact that this is a look, this study is a look at the economic relationship over the next 10 years is not to say that other issues are not important, but to emphasize the fact that the bedrock is still the economic relationship. Certainly without that, you know, it's hard to do anything else. Okay. But with that, we may not succeed completely either. There is obviously a, a potential downside as well, but we, it's a necessary but not sufficient condition for us to have a strong economic relationship. And what we really are focusing on is how do we actually create that over the next 10 years. So I'm happy to have with me on, on, on the panel uh, four distinguished panelists who have all had a part in directing the study or actually writing chapters in the study. So they're the experts uh, on, on this. Uh, to my left, I'd like to introduce uh, Vice Minister Ma, Ma Xiu Hong. Uh, Vice Minister Ma uh, was the Vice Minister of Commerce at a crucial time during China's WTO entry 
And most importantly, she was very much involved in the implementation of China's WTO obligations post-entry. So uh, also I have uh, Yana Remis, who is a principal uh, uh, from the McKinsey Global Institute. And she has been the author of the chapter on the Chinese middle class. And that's uh, something that, frankly, the whole world is very interested in. And we look for some very interesting thoughts from Yana later on. I have on my right uh, John Zhao. John is the CEO of Honey Capital, which is the investment arm of Legend Holdings, and is a global investor as well as a major investor inside China itself. And uh, on my ex extreme right is Peter Seligman, chairman and CEO of Conservation International, one of the most prominent uh, um, uh, NGOs that are really working in the environmental area and doing a number of major projects in the environment, and have been. Uh, Peter has been responsible for the chapter on, on uh, sustainability and, and so on in the report, which is part of our report. So let me start the uh, uh, discussion by turning first to Minister Ma. Uh, Minister, you know that the last, uh, as I said in my opening, in the last 30 years, you might say that the relationship between the U.S. was initiated on the basis of trade. And trade certainly was the the thing that has built a very strong bedrock over the last 30 years. As you look on that particular development, what are your thoughts about that? And very importantly, I'd like, very much like to get your view about how this relationship on trade and investment will evolve in the next 10 years. Thank you. It's my great pleasure to participate in today's uh, uh, meeting. Particularly, I'm very pleased to see the paper delivered yesterday and uh, get very positive uh, reaction uh, from uh, many aspects. I think everybody very concerned uh, about uh, uh, Sino-US uh, economic and trade uh, relationship, uh, not only for past 30 years, uh, but most concern is for next 10 or even longer uh, period. So I think uh, the paper delivered uh, information about uh, very bright future in the next 10 years. So it's very important uh, to confident to the people who are involved uh, in these aspects. So just as uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Feng said, and uh, also as uh, the, the first uh, several uh, speakers uh, delivered uh, the information. The, in the past uh, uh, 34 years, uh, the trade uh, and uh, other fields uh, in <coughs> economic and trade uh, relationship developed uh, very rapidly. At the beginning, when uh, two countries set up a diplomatic uh, relationship, the trade volume is only 2.5 billion US dollars. But in last year, the trade between two countries in goods already reached nearly 500 billion US dollars. The trade in service is about, uh, was about uh, 41.5 billion US dollars. And the tourists from China to US is over 1.8 million people. And the tourists from US to China is about uh, 2 million. So it's a lot. At the beginning, when we set up a diplomatic relationship, there is uh, only very small amount of uh, trade volume. There is no other cooperation in other fields. But right now, the trade volume in goods, as well as in service, uh, is really expanding so rapidly and uh, has very big fundamental changes in this field. But most uh, interesting thing is that the relationship between China and the uh, U.S. in economic and trade not only present uh, in the trading aspects, but also in many, many other sectors. The foreign inv uh, the investment is one of the very important part. By the end of uh, last year, the investment from U.S., direct investment from US, uh, U.S. to China is uh, 
reached uh, 70 billion US dollars uh, accumulatedly. From China to US, it's over 10 billion US dollars. The investment from China is only started from recent years. So one uh, 10 billion is not a very big figure, but it shows one of uh, very important uh, sectors for further Central U.S. Uh, economic and trade uh, relationship. <coughs> for next 10 years, I think the paper already shows very clear. It's very bright future. But of course, uh, the precondition is that the China and U.S. can keep sustainable and uh, healthy development uh, in bilateral relationship. There is no uh, very clear figures uh, for 10 years, uh, but the, the figures shows in the paper, I think uh, it's very encouraging. <clears throat> but at least uh, for next five years, I think uh, there is uh, something we can uh, predict, such as uh, the trade uh, between, uh, the trade, the, not only uh, between China and US, but uh, I can give, uh, uh, give you some uh, figures for next uh, uh, five years uh, for China with the whole world. The trade uh, uh, for <coughs> China, the international trade figures, uh, I think uh, can uh, reach, uh, in next five years, uh, were reached uh, more than uh, the, the import, the import uh, uh, for China uh, were reached uh, more than uh, 10 trillion, 10 trillion uh, US dollars. The, uh, that's in goods. But in service, the trade in service uh, uh, were reached uh, uh, 500 billion US dollars, uh, two, two, uh, 200, 2 trillion US dollars. The investment uh, from China to uh, the overseas investment uh, from China can reach uh, 500 billion US dollars. And uh, the FDI flow into China, I, I think can keep uh, the uh, scale of uh, uh, 100 billion US dollars every year. So that's uh, some basic figures. But of course, uh, in tourist cooperation, in agricultural cooperation, in science cooperation, in, some, in many other aspects, uh, I think uh, there will be very encouraging future. And for next 10 years, I believe, uh, according to the deep reform and the further open, opening up uh, for China, China will become uh, the largest uh, market in the world, as well as uh, one of the largest uh, investors in the world. So probably the Chinese uh, investment in U.S. will be larger than a U.S. investment in China. That's my, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's my uh, resort of uh, studying. But, but uh, of course, uh, uh, some other some other areas, uh, I think uh, China and U.S. can have uh, very good uh, cooperation besides uh, trade and investment, such as uh, in the uh, uh, multiple trading organization, such as uh, uh, WTO. I think uh, although right now there is uh, difficulties uh, for WTO's nego uh, Doha round uh, negotiation, but based on the cooperation, from China to uh, other nations, uh, particularly uh, with U.S., I think uh, we can push forward to have a more strengthened, stronger uh, multiple uh, trading system. And also in other, other uh, fields, such as uh, the regional uh, trade and uh, investment uh, cooperation, the China and U.S. are very active uh, participant uh, in FTA uh, manners. Although we are start yet to talking about FTA between China and the US, but I think uh, since uh, both countries are very interested in, 
in uh, facilitate uh, the uh, convenience for investment and uh, trade matters. So the, as a proposal from this paper, if uh, China and US can starting to thinking about or uh, studying the feasibility study for uh, setting up FTA, or we can starting the negotiation for FTA. I think that's a very interesting and challenging things, but the result, I believe, uh, will be bring very bright future for both nations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I, I think that is an extremely good background, you know, with somebody who has been really involved in, on the firing line on this whole development, especially in recent years, especially in the development of trade and how trade is now leading to a much more varied and multiple areas of cooperation. One thing I'd like to explore a little bit more, you know, we, in, in the study, we feel that it would be very interesting to start a more um, thorough understanding of the possibility of an FTA between US and China. What in your mind, Minister, would be some of the major obstacles uh, to having that happen? You know, I, I, I think, you know, if it can be done, obviously we can see a very bright future and maybe all those relatively nice forecasts would even have to be revised upwards. But how do you think uh, the, some of the issues that would be involved in the feasibility of an FTA? I think from an uh, economic point of view, it's very possible for China and U.S. Uh, to starting thinking about uh, to set up uh, FTA agreement. Because uh, you, uh, U.S. and China <coughs> are first the largest and second largest uh, eco uh, economy body uh, in the world. And also the first and the second largest uh, trading power. Right now, U.S. is the largest uh, overseas investment uh, investors, as well as the largest uh, FDA recipient country, and China is uh, the second largest uh, yeah. FDA recipient country, only behind uh, U.S. and the fifth largest uh, overseas investors right now. But of course, according to the rapid, uh, rapid growing for uh, overseas investor, uh, investment, uh, China quite soon, I think, uh, become the third one. Not only from, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, GDP and uh, trade and uh, investment, but in many other aspects. I think for China and uh, US, from uh, implement the free and uh, convenient trade and investment uh, can be very good partner. So that's the basic uh, conditions for considering if it's necessary to have FTA or not. But of course, uh, from another side, for US and China is very different in, uh, in development level as well as uh, the conditions uh, in many other aspects. So if uh, we are thinking about uh, setting up uh, FT, uh, negotiate for FTA, I think it's also very challenging things. But uh, when uh, the uh, questions be raised, uh, I think last year, from my idea is why not? At least we can try to think about it and studying what's the result of setting up FTA. I think uh, that's uh, challenges for everybody, but it's very hopeful to let everybody think about, to promote about it, to, final, to finally find the positive one, much more than the negative one. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. I, I certainly agree with you. You know, maybe the ultimate goal of a complete FTA is, is long and, and relatively difficult. But the process of looking at that possibility is going to create an environment and atmosphere 
that can be conducive to a much better relations and could also reveal some interesting things that both sides can work on constructively. So thank you. Uh, I, I think, let me turn to you next, Jana. Um, you know, I, I think all of us have thought about China, especially pre-2008, as the factory for the world. And we thought of China as the place to produce. But I think what has become very clear now, especially post the Lehman crisis in 2008, is the enormous potential of China as a market. And the thing that is driving China as a market, of course, is the growth of the Chinese middle class. And Yana, you working at the uh, McKinsey Global Institute have really contributed a very interesting chapter in our study on focusing on studying all the ins and outs of the Chinese middle class. Can you share some of that very quickly with us? But the thing I want to get to is, what are the opportunities for the businessman uh, as a result of this huge growth of, from 230 million, Mike, you were saying, to 630 million in this middle class segment uh, in 10 years' time? So, Jana. Thank you, Victor. Thank you for the invitation to contribute to the uh, report, as well as thank you for CSIS for the opportunity to be here this morning. It really is the sheer size of the Chinese rapidly growing middle class that makes it such a large economic opportunity. As we have heard, the size of Chinese middle class today is already 70% of the U.S. population. And the way we define middle class is starting from the income of $10 or more a day, <coughs> which, is at the t uh, which is a time when you can afford to pay not just for the basic necessities of food, shelter, and clothing, but you have about 30% of your income to spend in discretionary goods and services. So while it's obviously clear that the average income of the Chinese consumers is significantly lower than the U.S. consumers and will continue to be, it is the large number that are already starting to tilt the global markets in a way that's very visible. Let me give you two examples. Flat screen TVs. Last year, there were 50 million units sold in China against 42 million in U.S. and Canada combined. Laptop computers, there were 27 million units sold in China against 22 in the US. So already, we are seeing China be a much bigger marketplace in many segments, and it's not just electronics, there's a number of other goods and services as well. And this is the situation today. We are also seeing the growth very rapidly. As um, Larry and Mike both mentioned, we will see the Chinese middle class grow from 70% of US population today to roughly twice the size of the US population. So this is a very significant growth, that even though we tend to focus on the fact that the average growth rate of China is declining somewhat, we should not forget the fact that we continue to apply the growth to an increasing base of either GDP or consumption, which means that the absolute growth that we are seeing in China is and will continue to be very, very high and growing. So then to Victor's question, why does that matter, or what are the opportunities? Clearly, the capacity of China's middle class to become a real engine of global growth is the most positive news, perhaps, that we could think for the global economy today. Um, that is something that the U.S. consumers have been for years, and as we see the demographic tailwind, if you want, declining. It is a very important message overall. And for companies who are looking for new growth opportunities, that is a big market, both in terms of experts as well as investments in China. But it is not just taking them to China. I think, fortunately, as both Larry and Minister Ma mentioned, Chinese consumers are increasing their share of consumption. That includes tourism. They were somewhere close to 1.8 1 1 1 million tourists in the U.S., when you look at the Chinese consumers, one out of 10 of the upper middle class consumers visited a place outside China last year. And in total, there were 80 million outbound tourists from China. So the growth opportunities are very large. And this is, again, remember today, and it's one out of 10 of the upper middle class only. There is large opportunities for that to create jobs, not just in the US, but in the Asian, proto-Asian environment as well. And the good news about tourism is that it's one of the industries with most labor intensive impact. So it creates a lot of jobs across the globe. Yet 
in addition to just the pure consumption, it will actually have impact more broadly. As we see the share of emerging consumers be larger in the global economy, it will loom large on the companies' decisions on where they are going to invest and what they are going to do uh, in their next, year, next term priorities. And that means that they will want to know what do the Chinese consumers prefer, what are their preferences, and it, that will influence the kinds of innovations, the kinds of investments and productivity improvements that companies will look for. So that will create a new challenge for companies of understanding what is going on with the Chinese and other emerging consumers, but it also will influence the kinds of goods and services that we will see in this country, because companies are going to change where and how they do things as a result of larger and larger parts of their uh, consumers being in the emerging world. Jana, thank you very much for that. I, I must say that I, uh, for, as a member of the business sector, I totally agree with you. What we're really seeing now is the supply chains are being, becoming a lot more complex in the world. Pre-2008, let's say, you know, the whole world used to think about sourcing from the developing countries, mainly from Asia, and selling in the OECD market. So you buy from the East and you sell in the West, and it's sort of unidirectional supply chains. And the containers, remember, used to come back empty. But now, where is the market? And it's not clear that it's actually your supply chains are a lot more nuanced. And the development is also now, how do you actually supply Asia? And we're also seeing a lot of goods flowing this way uh, from, from produced in Europe, produced in America, because why? You produce things in Italy, for example, for sale in China, because made in Italy commands a premium in China. Uh, food sourced from the US, made in USA, commands a premium in China. So I think that the world is becoming a lot more complex. And I may also point out, Minister Ma, that in terms of the trade statistics, I totally agree with the forecast. But if you look at the complexion of the trade, uh, I think the imports into China used to be majority, two-thirds or more, basically semi-finished goods and, and, and raw materials. Now, as China moves away from being just the world's factory, but also the world's market, you're going to see the import of a lot more finished goods, finished products. And I think that the whole complexion of the trade is shifting. So I think I thank you for giving us that, that picture. Let me now move on to you, John. And uh, I, I know you're, you're one of the most active investors in China and increasingly outside of China. You know, why don't you give us a little bit your view about you know, how the Chinese direct investment, and since you wrote a chapter on that, is, is actually developing and what sort of impact do you think uh, that will be relevant, let's say, in the United States as a result of outbound Chinese investments? Thanks, Victor. Uh, good morning, everybody. <coughs> uh, it's my pleasure to, to be able to be here and uh, uh, share with uh, everybody some of the uh, experiences we have. Well, it has been said uh, often that uh, what happened in China in the last 30 years is an economic miracle. Much of this is being driven and contributed by FDI. And American investment in China has played a very large role. In the report, we listed some of the numbers, and Larry was uh, summarizing that as well. Cumulatively, we have up to 70 billion US dollar invested in China through so-called direct investments. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will leave the numbers to everybody's reading, but I want to tell the story that is beyond the numbers. Uh, if you look at the China, some of you have uh, been visiting China recently. A typical middle-class Chinese life start with maybe waking up to a American tune uh, and uh, drinking a cup of Starbucks coffee, uh, making a call uh, to inform his later arrival because Beijing's traffic was an Apple phone and for sure will probably uh, uh, you know, drive, if he drives or she drives, a Buick uh, <laughs> to work. And then the story goes on. That's a result of FDI that started 30 years ago when Motorola opened the factory and when um, Kentucky Fried Chicken decided that that's the world's largest, uh, largest emerging markets. And so FDI uh, effect goes really beyond and associated with all these numbers are ways of life. For us, what we've seen very significantly in the last few years is 
the way that the companies will be governing, managing, and carry themselves. Uh, and that's very powerful, so much so that a lot of Chinese companies are ready to <coughs> not only serve the domestic requirement, but also utilize the resources to serve the uh, uh, ever-changing demand uh, in the world. So the second point I wanted to make is the FDI uh, from China to the world, especially to US, is coming and is increasing very, very rapidly. But the one thing uh, that I wanted to share is that uh, having facilitating some of these investment into U.S. And, and, and doing more, it's very different. And I think now and in, maybe for the next decade or so, a lot of these Chinese FDI into uh, Europe, uh, into U.S., are actually very domestic focused. They're not like Japanese when they came out uh, to the U.S. And, and it was really for, you know, the market that is in the U.S., majority of the Chinese FDI into U.S. would be actually for bringing back the concept, management, service concept, technology to actually better serve their domestic markets, the 200 million to 600 million middle class transition, because you know it's actually very simple to calculate. That's the market. That's the focus. So my uh, uh, point beyond the report is that uh, these investments, alongside with continuous U.S. investment into China, would actually all be focusing on uh, arguably the best market opportunity, which happens in China. So a lot of these will be uh, greenfield investment in U.S. to bring uh, human capital into serving Chinese requirement to bring technology into applying for Chinese characteristics. And certainly, there will be some of the investments that are for securing the food security that is in China, energy security that is in China. So it's very different. I don't think the world has seen that. It's not the kind of direct investment that's saying, you know, uh, you know buying to the foreign markets, at least for the next 10 years. So what it really leads to is, I think, the next round of FDI, uh, which is very different. You know, the last 30 years, it's one-way street from U.S. to China. In the next 10 years, it'll be two-way street. Uh, a lot U.S. direct investment into China, like before, very refined, you know, <coughs> moving from factory to service sector. Um, and even more, uh, Chinese investment to U.S., again, bring uh, the concept technology, again, for Chinese market. Uh, this two-way exchange for direct investment would actually create, hopefully, uh, some benefit that is beyond uh, just FDI. Uh, for instance, the opening up of Chinese capital market. Uh, when the Chinese do not have a requirement or need to invest their capital to foreign market, they tend to close up their capital market. When they have this need, there's mutual requirement, bilateral exchanges. If we're going to do FDI or F, uh, uh, FTA, I'm sure opening up of foreign uh, capital market is very top on the list, and that will actually further enlarge the mutual uh, benefit. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John. That, that was very insightful. You know, one of the things that you were talking that came to me is, you know, the U.S.-China relations came from a very simple, you might even say simplistic origins. When diplomatic relations were established, it was basically uh, a, a pure beginnings of a trading relationship. And then it developed more and more. People then started thinking about using China as a manufacturing base for re-exports and so on. That is relatively simple. But now when you think about selling to China as well as manufacturing in China, you're obviously digging deeper into the innards of the economy and you're encountering more issues. And as you now think about not only just selling products to China, but actually selling services to China, that really touches the internal legal system and everything. So I, I, I take the view that the complexity 
of the Chinese, the U.S.-China relation actually is a natural progression. And in my mind, it's a very healthy one. It's, it's obvious that as you get into deeper and deeper engagement, the relationship gets more and more complex. And also, then you've got to resolve more and more issues, but the relationship is developing. The reason these issues develop is because you are more deeply engaged. If you're only thinking about manufacturing in China or just exporting from China, it's a very simple relationship. But now you're thinking about selling services into China, it's a totally different thing, but it's something that we should all think about addressing and addressing over time. And John, you really brought that out, I was really, but one, I will let you go, one thing before you, you know, you, you, you say this, this really has raised, a, 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 you know, other issues and so on. What's your view about the efficacy of a bilateral agreement on investments and how that would actually help the, the, the mutual two-way flow of investments? Because I know a lot of uh, people in China are, are thinking of investing more in the U.S. and would, for example, the sovereign wealth funds. Would, would more clarity on what they can or cannot invest up front that might be embodied in a bilateral investment relationship actually facilitate a better flow? Yeah, I think uh, if you can uh, have an agreement or even just the understanding up front, that will be very, very helpful. There's some uh, mystery about uh, Chinese companies uh, or investors, and because and, and, you know, it's known that <coughs> Uh, state-owned enterprises or SOEs uh, still play a large role in Chinese economy and the in early attempts of foreign investments by Chinese companies have been facilitated or driven by these um, SOEs. Um, you know, um, financial crisis brought down the whole system. The Chinese realized they really need to go secure resources uh, because, you know, just to feed that huge demand and they can't rely on um, uh, things that they don't control. It just so happened that uh, some of these, those are sectors that are monopolized still uh, by the state owned company. So they came out and got into a lot of, uh, um, um, you know, debate. <coughs> but uh, just like any economy, the, the real driver of the economy is actually private sectors, non SOEs. Mm. And these guys are coming out. Um, for instance, Lenovo, this is one of our subsidiaries uh, under Legend Holdings, came here and uh, made an acquisition of. IBM PC asset, and, and it's just a, you know all around a success story after about six or seven years. The, the brand lives on, and the, the jobs are preserved and expanded, and the way of managing a good multinational global companies have gotten into China before it was all driven by U.S. driven companies. The benefit just goes on and goes on. So, so I think some clarity uh, mm -hmm. in that regard, mm -hmm. or understanding in that regard, would mm -hmm. be very, very important. Well, I think that's certainly one thing. Even if we don't go all the way to a bilateral FTA, perhaps some sort of understanding on investments could be, you know, at least an, an intermediate objective. So let me go from there uh, to you, Peter. I, you know, we, you know, we we listen to some very interesting uh, uh, statistics and and, and 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 developments in the U.S.-China bilateral relations, and. Sitting here in the audience, a lot of us could be thinking about, wow, you know, the two largest consuming nations in the world, the two largest emitters, <laughs> the two largest users of energy. You know, it, it, I, I can't help but think that the world, is, in, in Mike Spencer's word, could be sitting on a consumption time bomb. And the U.S. and China are the two main, shall we say, players in that. So what do you think are the areas where U.S. and China could really work together to achieve some large-scale sustainability gains for themselves and the rest of the world? Thank you, and thank you for the, for the invitation to be here. Uh, there's a lot of detail in the, in the chapter that we, we wrote, and, uh, and I, I guess that will be released today or tomorrow, so that would really be the place to dive in and, and get the long list. Um, I think that there are, just before I kind of directly answer that question, um, I'm listening to this conversation and thinking about my my history in China, and I've been going to China for, since 1985. Um, 
uh, actually 1980 is when I first went to China. And I think that what you just described is really important. It's as you get into more detailed components of the economies and the relationships, uh, you begin to uncover, you know, little barriers, but you have a conversation. And I think the most important thing for us to really understand is uh, there's a very important opportunity right now. Number one, there's an opportunity for creating trust. And we need trust to deal with these issues. We are really, there's, it's, it, we cannot <coughs> not work together. We have to. And that takes trust. And so we have to really be focusing on that. And secondly, there's leadership. And this is really what's important for this conversation and important going forward, that we're dealing with some global challenges that are the X factor. And the X factor is, uh, is the environment within which our economies operate. And, and it's easy to look at climate change as one of those X factors. Um, and we can recount recent developments uh, in terms of hurricanes, in terms of tornadoes, in terms of floods, in terms of opening up of trade routes because the ice is melting. Uh, so many things are happening relating to climate shifts. Um, and, and it's destabilizing. It's threatening to the, 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 uh, the capacity of the United States. It's threatening to the capacity of China. And we have the two largest emitters um, although it's important to distinguish that CO2 emissions per capita are three times as high in the United States as in China. Per capita. Per capita. Per capita. And so it's, let's say, 5.2 CO2 metric tons per capita in China. I think it's 17.3 or 18 for the United States. So, so uh, it's not as if it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an equal uh, playing field um, in, in terms of the driving of the economy. So, so going forward, I think that we need to be focusing, if we're really going to be thinking about these issues, on, uh, on, on two big um, interrelated challenges. One challenge is how do we reduce very, as quickly as we possibly can, CO2 emissions. The U.S. and China have an opportunity for global leadership, and I'm very enthusiastic about the conversations that are being had right now, that there's a recognition that there's an opportunity to actually come together and address that. And what we have to be looking at is how do we work away from subsidies for fossil fuels? How do we uh, increase uh, investments in renewable resources? Um, how do we share technologies and innovations? And it cannot just be government to government. It has to be university to university. It has to be private sector to private sector, because we really are in a race against time right now. As New York Times published a few, um, um, a few uh, weeks ago, uh, we now have CO2 levels that are uh, at the highest in one million years. Um, uh, that's even before our economies started to grow. So it, we've, we've got, and at the same time, what we know uh, is, uh, is that we have another challenge, and the other challenge we have is that our renewable natural resources, that's our, our food, our water, our fisheries, are directly impacted by CO2 concentrations. Ocean acidification impacting the productivity of coral reefs. Three quarters of the global fisheries have been severely impacted by overfishing, and we have the capacity globally to take to catch right now four times the amount of fish in the ocean. Um, we have enormous subsidies for our fisheries industries, and we're destabilizing the ecosystem health and. Actually, not only do we have the highest CO2 emission levels in a million years, but our extinction rates are higher than the Pleistocene. They're about between 1,000 and 100,000 times normal. So, so we actually right now are in the process of destabilizing the capability of nature to provide essential services for humanity. And that's a shared challenge that, that our countries have. At the same time, and this goes back to, the, to uh, uh, Yana's discussion about the middle class, uh, in the next four decades, we're going from 7 billion people to 9.5 billion or so. We're going to double the size of the global middle class, which means that we're going to double the amount of energy we need, we're going to double the amount of fresh water we need, and we're going to double the amount of food we need, all uh, on a, 
on a, a planet that is uh, is destabilized by by climate shifts and and uh, and ecosystem deterioration. Now, that really calls for intense, trusted collaboration between the United States and China as the two largest consuming nations. And you mentioned consumption. What's really frightening is that within 12 and 18 months of consumption of any product, about three quarters of resources that are used for production are actually thrown away. So we are extraordinarily inefficient. So when we look at efficiencies, that will give us about 50% of the, the reductions that we need. We have to look at, at, we can look at land use management in order to, to if we protect forests, we're gonna together, the United States and China collaborate on forest conservation. Uh, we can reduce global emissions by you know 16 to 17%. So there are specific actions that our countries could take if we collaborate uh, on, on some of these specifics. Peter, thank you. You know, Peter, I, I think that's really a great exposition on the X factor, especially on climate change. You know, you talked about trust and leadership. I, I can't help but think as you were talking. You know, when we talk about this bilateral relationship between US and China, I think our focus has to be much more than on those two countries. You know, what we're really talking about is China and the US having the opportunity and indeed I would say the responsibility to actually take the leadership to actually do something for the whole globe which in turn obviously will help themselves. This idea of this collaboration uh, looking at this bilateral relationship as something that would actually help create global public good in, especially in this sustainability area. You know we looked at all the numbers and so on you know, it's great, you know, this, the, the graphs keep going up, but then you, how about the rest of the equation, you know? It's kind of not there, you know? So I, I, think, I think we really need to look at this from a lot bigger basis. This relationship is not just about the two countries. It's about the world. And how the two countries now have to seize this moment, seize the moment. We've got a new leadership on the Chinese side. We've got a new administration in the U.S., I'm so glad they're meeting in California, nice sunshine, and some people will say not in Washington, <laughs> maybe on the golf course or what have you, and really, hopefully, without, agenda, without a specific agenda, but talking about these types of issues. How, how would the two countries and their leaders seize the moment and really provide some global leadership and create some, you know, we, the whole multilateral system in the world, in my mind, needs fixing. It's done its job for the last 40 years, 50 years. It's now time to update that. And really, we, we need, and we're facing all these new challenges. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I think I'd like to thank the panel and then uh, and get Matt up here and conduct the <laughs> session. You're not, you're not off the hook yet, um, and um, we're going to do a few Q&A. Um, uh, we're running a little behind, but if, uh, since I gave you an unscheduled break uh, earlier, uh, if you'll indulge, we'll, we'll cut about 10 minutes into the, uh, the next break. So I see a lot of hands, and I'm going to sort of sweep left to right. So over here, please. Please I, I identify yourself. Wait for the microphone. Identify yourself, and uh, please do ask a question. Clement Miller from Wilmington Trust Investment Advisors, and my question is really about capital markets. And um, it's kind of puzzling to me and to other portfolio investors that while China has grown by maybe 40 to 50 percent over the last four to five years, that stock prices have been basically flat. Uh, so uh, what's the story there, and uh, will these reforms uh, lead to uh, you know, greater returns for investors? That has my name written all over it. Uh, we need you. We need you to come participate. 75% uh, to 80% of investors in Chinese secondary market are individual investors. And they're still in the learning cycle and very speculative. Um, 
And uh, it is being found that uh, when you have a large percentage investors that are institutional investors managed by professionals, uh, then it will help. And it will take a long time, but that's the direction it is going. That's why opening up the capital market to global participant inside China will be the critical step next. Hi, my name is Eric Lowe. I'm with the Fair Observer. Uh, I think we just, uh, in the in previous uh, context, we talked about like food safety. I think that there's a current situation in Shanghai or something about like the, the, the baby milk of how the people just grabbing any foreign produced uh, baby milk, you know, even run a, uh, a big thing in Hong Kong. So I think that why, uh, in a certain extent, you know, like if the Chinese uh, uh, consumer cannot trust Chinese goods, so how can foreign people trust their 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 their, their own good uh, the the food coming out of China? So do you see that there is a need for standards of situations so that these things could be more properly managed? Thank you. That directed at anyone in particular, or okay, I know Madam Ma, maybe. The food uh, safety issues is very uh, critical. Uh, critical. Uh, I think uh, for the new uh, government, uh, it's uh, one of the priority tasks. In order to uh, solve uh, this uh, problem, uh, right now for the new uh, cabinet, uh, there is a new department to be set up, particularly to in charge uh, food safety issues uh, from top uh, government. But of course, uh, <coughs> according to the uh, direction and uh, uh, the policies, uh, there will be the system for uh, concerning and solve the issues related to uh, food safety. Because uh, that's not only the issues uh, need to be considered by the industry or by the market, but also it's very, very important for the, the attitude of the people, of the consumers. So the, 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 the particular issues uh, you mentioned, I think it's uh, only one of the small part. Uh, but uh, food safety is uh, a big, uh, much more bigger issues. So uh, for the uh, China-US uh, uh, cooperation sectors, I think uh, food safety is also one of the them. So how to use these uh, uh, channels uh, to enhance uh, cooperation to help China to solve these issues? I think it's also one of the very important uh, uh, issues that need to be considered. But of course, uh, it's uh, one of the, st uh, the stage problem. I'm confident that uh, along with uh, the development of China and along with the uh, the, 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 the cooperation between uh, government, uh, industry, and uh, market and uh, consumers. And of course, uh, based on the cooperation uh, with the uh, international cooperation, I think these issues can be solved uh, step by step. Thank you, Madam. Uh, yes, I, might, I might oh, add sorry, uh, to, to the minister to say that I certainly totally agree. And from a business standpoint, I think while China is really um, uh, uh, fixing this whole uh, food chain and safety issue, I think they could actually provide an opportunity, a business opportunity, actually for the supply of foods and maybe long-term cooperation, uh, both in setting food standards and technology and also actual supply of food. I see, we see this in the report as one of the major areas for cooperation. Thank you. Robert Charetta, President of International Investor, uh, also for Minister Ma. Uh, first of all, thank you for making your presentation in English. We, we, we do appreciate that. But my question does concern our trade imbalance between the United States and China. Your projections show that both economies will become the largest in the world. They are already and both have enormous trading relations and it'll only grow larger. So don't you believe it's important that we each take steps to try to bring our trade in imbalance? And don't you, uh, can you tell us about any programs in China that are encouraging 
purchases by either consumers or businesses of U.S. goods that would try to at least lower this uh, trade imbalance that we have? Trade balance is always uh, the key priority concern uh, by both sides. I think uh, uh, it's uh, not only right now, but uh, we'll keep these uh, issues uh, for next 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but according to the uh, result of uh, uh, studying uh, in the uh, papers delivered yesterday, I think uh, there is uh, a still large uh, deficit figures uh, by the end of the uh, next 10 years. Uh, but I don't think it's uh, some uh, key issues uh, can impact a lot uh, for a bilateral economic and trade uh, relationship. Because uh, when China become uh, the first uh, or largest uh, market for US, even the, 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 the uh, Deficit, uh, deficit uh, between uh, two countries' uh, uh, trade is still there. But there are a lot of uh, other benefits uh, from this trade uh, to both sides, uh, particularly, I think, uh, for U.S. And when we're thinking about uh, the figures that shows uh, in this paper, I think uh, one element uh, needs to be uh, added uh, in this uh, uh, result of studying. Because this figure only shows uh, the goods, the, the, the trade in goods, but there is no other figures for the uh, trade in services. Why, uh, during my uh, uh, speaking, I particularly mentioned uh, the uh, trade in service, uh, although it's uh, still not a very <coughs> large uh, uh, figure, such as last year, the trade uh, in service between two countries uh, was uh, uh, 41.5 billion US dollars. It's uh, not large uh, as uh, the, the, the trade in goods, but it's a rapid development, uh, rapid uh, growing one. And for the trade in services uh, uh, from China, it's uh, a deficit. Because uh, uh, last year, uh, we import much more than we export uh, to US. The deficit uh, between, uh, for China uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the trade in service uh, is uh, three times uh, higher than uh, the total. But uh, in, uh, so uh, in the future, I think uh, the, uh, the trade in service uh, will keep the high uh, growth rate. So by the end of next 10 years, uh, I, I think when we're think, uh, thinking about uh, service in trade, the trade uh, deficit uh, were much lower than uh, the figures shown in this paper. L Larry, did you want to add something there? Thank, thank you very much. The, uh, I want to tell you, just during the break, a gentleman came up to me, I forgot his name. Yeah, he's there, yeah. Who, who was chairman of the Sivius, right? And who, who actually- Steve, Steve Kanner, yeah. former colleague at Treasury. Right. Um, he actually berated me for even mentioning the uh, bilateral trade surplus. <laughs> he said, we, we shouldn't really talk about bilateral trade surplus. You know, and the uh, e you know, economists, uh, good economists should never talk about <laughs> bilateral trade surplus because it really doesn't matter. Uh, what matters actually is the aggregate trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis the world. Um, I think for China, it's actually coming down very rapidly, um, you know, trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis the world. And, and I think for the United States, the trade deficit is also coming down rapidly vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. I think, I think you know, the, uh, you, you can see the figures coming in. I think when, uh, when you uh, shale gas, shale oil coming in full stream, I think you would, you would actually see it coming down. So I wouldn't worry about the bilateral trade surplus, okay? I mean, we, we should actually educate our citizens not to worry about, <laughs> about the bilateral trade surplus. But having said that, uh, let, let me say one more thing, and that is the, today is really, uh, uh, is really not necessarily focused on the growth trade surplus because uh, what matters is really value added. Like Apple, 
Apple is actually a huge export from China to the U.S. because it's finally assembled in, in China. But Chinese value added is about 3 to 4 percent. And Apple's gross profit margin is 50 percent. So, you know, you really shouldn't blame China's. I mean, <laughs> this is a huge export from China to the, to the U.S. So I think that is really, that's really the way to, yeah. <laughs> so that's really the way to, to really think about it is really not to get, uh, you know, too focused on the gross bilateral trade surplus, but really focus on the value added, on the employment generated, and so forth. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to just take two quick questions, and then and then we will stop there. Uh, gentleman there, and the gentleman there. Uh, Robert Kopakin, former Department of Energy employee. My question would be for Mr. Seligman. Um, the Economist, not so many months ago, had a cover story uh, showing a, a barren island, uh, which was, the question was, are these countries going to fight over this particular scrap of land? But it, it characterized the, the search for potential commodities in the South China Sea uh, with all of the territorial disputes that are, exist there as a potential source of tension and even conflict between the two countries, and actually between several countries with different territorial claims. How can we minimize that uh, in light of the need for energy resources of all of those countries? Okay, thanks, sir. Could you just hand the microphone to him? Hi, uh, Chen Weihua, China Daily. Yeah, I have a question for Minister Ma. I mean, um, today you talked about uh, a uh, lot of cooperation. I'm just wondering how you worried about these increasing competition and uh, frictions going to affect, uh, disrupt uh, the full achieving of this uh, cooperative potential, I mean, the coming decade. Thank you. I'm going to take just one more. There was a lady there who I didn't get to recognize right there. Yep. Yes, with her hand up. Could someone get the microphone to her? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Rosemary Sekera. I'm the president of Sekera's International Group. We focus on venture capital. And uh, I want to thank you so much for the, your wonderful presentation. While I'm a USA-based uh, Kanban, I'm also from Africa. I'm from Kenya. Thank you for the Chinese for the wonderful work you are doing in Africa and the matching market. They are working so hard, and I thank you so much for that. How do you collaborate with, like now I'm here in the best in the USA, looking at uh, the venture capital here, and then also working with Africa. Are there other opportunities, looking at Clopo, of direct investments, uh, which are, uh, that are in Africa, than me doing business here, and then also taking the same knowledge and uh, uh, business to Africa, uh, looking at the matching now market in Africa. How do you do that, looking at Clopoly? And thank you again. Okay, thanks. So we have three questions about energy, competition, uh, friction in the bilateral relationship, and African investment. So maybe, Peter, you were addressed first. Good luck. Thank you. <laughs> if, so I think you asked me how I would solve the conflict in the South China Sea. Is that what it was? Is that <laughs> <attention>? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that last night, as a matter of fact. <laughs> And you only have 30 seconds. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, yeah, that's 20 seconds. Thank you. That's. Uh, the <laughs> I really don't have. A, a, it, tensions always become exacerbated uh, during times of leadership change, and we have just gone through leadership change uh, in the United States uh, and in the People's Republic. Uh, so. Um, uh, it's been a very tense moment, and uh, and what I would do if I could do is I'd kick the can down the road, uh, uh, basically. Um, I think that that um, that and it's interesting you raise this question because last year Conservation International launched a Center for Environment and Peace, and the purpose of the Center for Environment and Peace was to really uh, address conflicts that arise and how do you avoid conflicts that will arise out of resource uh, competition because we're seeing that and you mentioned energy uh, but fisheries food water arable land uh, name it 
it's all, I mean, as you have uh, displaced populations, you end up with conflict. Um, so um, I will be, you know, I don't have an answer for the, 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 uh, the, uh, the South China Sea. It's not really, I don't think, my place to be giving an answer for that. Um, uh, but I think that uh, uh, what's absolutely clear is that uh, uh, we are going to have to, uh, to, we're going to have to be looking at some of these, these, these territorial claims and looking for some creative solutions. And one of these solutions that has emerged in the past few years has been uh, um, allowing um, a lack of clarity to continue and figuring out resource sharing scenarios or even having bilateral or trilateral peace parks or conservation areas. And, uh, and we've seen that happen in many different territories uh, in South America, in Asia, and now dealing in the Pacific uh, in, in different islands. So that's kind of where I would, I would lead. I think uh, competition and cooperation always combine each other. The uh, most important thing is not uh, a, a fear of a competition but uh, to continue in set up and improve uh, the business environment uh, for fair and uh, equal competition environment. So I think uh, if uh, uh, the, 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 the China, because uh, the uh, deep uh, reform is one of the uh, very important uh, uh, tasks for China's uh, future development, so along with uh, the deep uh, reform, the fair, and uh, open market for all of the participants uh, in the equal and fair competition, I think uh, will be helpful for China's uh, economic development uh, as well as uh, as good for further enhance uh, cooperation between two countries. Uh, the, the venture capital industry uh, alongside with later on private equity uh, industry is really uh, a, a, in the early early learning stage uh, as large as it seems to be so the history is very short uh, that probably could be a um, uh, you know example for some of the Africa markets uh, in terms of you know developing its own environment to encourage uh, capital market development and encourage innovation uh, alongside with that uh, I, I know that uh, many of the um, investors that are in China have started focusing foreign markets US is the one uh, as a matter of fact almost at uh, equal amount of uh, interests uh, certainly dollar amounts are focusing in the other emerging markets in Africa uh, for the market opportunity uh, that complements with what, what Chinese market needs. So I, I do believe there will be more and more exchanges. And But uh, again, domestically, uh, having the right set of policy and getting the market to open up is uh, very crucial. Okay, and Peter wanted to add something? Yeah, just on, on uh, um, it's interesting and important to talk about uh, about sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and going back to this opportunity for collaboration between the US and China in terms of leadership on addressing this, what I refer to as the X factor, which is the, the uh, kind of greening component of development. Um, I think it is really important that, that uh, our, our countries recognize that as we feed ourselves, think about the growth of our nations, um, that we recognize that uh, that uh, that sustainable or lasting development requires uh, sharing of technology and capability, not just between ourselves, but also with our trading partners. And as we look at Africa in particular, or other uh, places in the Americas um, uh, and Southeastern Asia, there's a great need for, uh, for uh, looking at lasting and sustainable supplies as opposed to short-term uh, um, mining of supplies. And that's a technology transfer that can be really important for long-term solutions, uh, looking at the uh, kind of the, 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 the health and sustainability of ecological resources. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you all panelists. Um, uh,
we have now officially eaten into the entire break uh, period, but I'm going to very generously give you seven and a half minutes. Uh, and then we're going to come back for the keynote presentations. Thank you. Thank you.